This hearing will now come to order. As this hearing is fully virtual, we must address a few housekeeping matters. For today's hearing, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I will ask if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we'll move to the next member until the issue has been resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You'll notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At the one minute remaining mark, the clock will turn yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time of the hearings call to order will be recognized in order of seniority. Finally, members who are not present at the time that the hearing is called to order uh, will be recognized in the order of arrival. Finally, house rules require me to remind you that we've set up an email address to which members can send anything that they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. That being said, I would like to welcome everyone to today's hearing, our first of this year. Before we get underway, I'd like to welcome Dr. Harris as the subcommittee's acting ranking member, as well as to welcome the other members of the subcommittee. Also on a somber note, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and remember our colleague, Representative Don Young, who passed away last week. Representative Young was the longest serving member of the house with 49 years of service. He was a strong advocate for the people of Alaska, a great public servant, a gentleman, and a friend. Uh, we will miss him, and we extend our deepest condolences to his family. I'd ask that at this time we observe a moment of silence uh, in honor of Representative Young. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome our witnesses this morning, Ms. Fong, Ms. Coffey, Mr. Harden, Ms. Roney, and Ms. Roan, excuse me, Mr. Terrell uh, from USDA's Office of Inspector General. Uh, thank you for appearing before us this morning. And I especially want to express my appreciation of Inspector Fong uh, for your dedicated service over the past eight months managing responsibilities for both USDA and the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Now, since the budget was just transmitted yesterday, this hearing will focus more on uh, the OIG's oversight of a wide ranging department that touches the lives of every single American. I'm pleased to note that the FY22 bill fully funded the president's request for the Office of Inspector General, which provided a very generous increase for your office. As I stated in previous years, I've always been a big supporter of your office. Day in and day out, OIG staff are truly the unsung heroes in the battle against waste, fraud, and abuse. Your work through audits, investigations, and reviews helps protect the taxpayer's interest while improving the department's effectiveness and efficiency. So like previous years, I'd like to hear more about your plans to conduct adequate oversight of USDA programs and the challenges you face in ensuring agreed upon recommendations are in fact implemented and complaints are appropriately addressed. Now let me invite our distinguished acting ranking member, Dr. Harris, 
If he has any opening remarks, and I'd like to recognize him at this time. Dr. Harris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Bishop, and I appreciate your flexibility and everyone's willingness to begin today's hearing earlier so that members can attend the memorial service for Representative Don Young. Ms. Fong, it's good to see you again, and I want to thank you and your staff for being with us today and for your being flexible with scheduling this morning as well. We appreciate the critical work your agency is performing. Conducting audits, investigations, and other activities is challenging work even under normal circumstances. However, over the past two years, programs have been set up or expanded in response to the pandemic, which has only made your work more important. According to the OIG's COVID funding dashboard, nearly $172 billion has been provided to USDA just for pandemic activities, with 78% of the funds going toward nutrition programs. I look forward to hearing more today about how your office monitors the programs and funding, especially when there are headlines like, quote, FBI sees massive fraud in groups, food programs for needy children, which was in the New York Times this month on March 9th. With billions and billions of federal dollars going out the door, it's very enticing for those who might want to defraud taxpayers. Your office, working with other federal, state, and local partners, is critical to ensuring program integrity through your audit and investigative functions. Your testimony also mentions the oversight your office will need to conduct with respect to the nearly $3 billion being provided for broadband loans and grants and watershed and flood prevention operations in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I look forward to hearing what your budgetary needs might be in order to conduct that work. As we continue to review the fiscal year 2023 budget materials, I remain concerned about the uncontrolled spending though that continues to drive up inflation. The administration continues to show a lack of regard for hard earned taxpayer dollars in this, in this regard, and we can't keep adding to our nearly $30 trillion national debt. At USDA, we depend upon your agency to provide us with information as to whether the department is effectively implementing the various programs and appropriately using taxpayer dollars. Again, I appreciate you being with us and look forward to today's hearing. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harris. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the full committee uh, chairwoman, Mr. Laura, is present. If she is, I would invite her to uh, offer any opening statement she would like. I know that she is, is quite busy and had another commitment uh, immediately. Um, uh, and if uh, Mr. Laura is not present, I would certainly invite the uh, full committee ranking member if she is present to have any uh, opening remarks. Not hearing from either of them, uh, I would at this, Point, I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Fong. Uh, Ms. Fong, um, I should uh, let you know that without objection, your entire written testimony will be included in the record. And I will now recognize you for your statement. And following that, we will proceed with questions. Ms. Fong, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Acting Ranking Member Harris and the distinguished members of the subcommittee we truly appreciate uh, your very warm welcoming remarks today and your, your support of our mission. And we appreciate the invitation to appear to talk about our oversight activities. And as the, Mr. Chairman, uh, you remarked earlier, we especially appreciate the um, expanded uh, funding for us for FY22 and um, the constructive dialogue that we have with members of the subcommittee all the time on ongoing issues. Uh, as you know, you know our mission. Um, we're here to help the department deliver its programs as effectively as possible. And ultimately, you also know that we do not have the authority to implement our own recommendations. We depend on USDA officials to take necessary corrective actions. For much of the past two years, uh, we have been working in a maximum telework setting. And I have to say, I am extremely proud of our dedicated staff. They have demonstrated flexibility and innovation. They've produced outstanding oversight work. Uh, as you all know, we've issued 33 audit products this past year. We obtained 228 convictions in criminal matters. 
and we reported over $686 million in dollar results for FY21, all of which demonstrates the dedication of our staff. As we move forward in FY22, uh, we have a number of challenges uh, in our oversight portfolio. We will continue to finish our work and start other work with respect to several major funding streams that some of you have alluded to. We are uh, finishing our work on all of the disaster assistance programs that were funded in the wake of the hurricanes in 2017. We have much ongoing work with respect to pandemic funds. Billions and billions of dollars went to the department for pandemic relief, and we have to um, provide appropriate oversight of that. And as you also allude to, the infrastructure investments that Congress passed this past November, uh, we do have oversight responsibilities for all of those programs as well. This is in addition to our normal portfolio of statutory mandates, of financial statement audits, improper payments, IT security, and, and other requirements, as well as our ongoing responsibilities to provide a level of oversight to all of USDA's programs and agencies. So we, we believe that our hands are full and to handle this increased workload, we will need all the resources that you have appropriated for us in FY22, as well as the uh, increase that's been proposed in the president's FY23 request. We will also have to work smarter on our own part, we're gonna to need to develop additional tools and approaches. And to that end, we are looking to our data analytics staff as we hone our ability to understand data, develop new approaches and products and identify potential areas for our audit and investigative work. This is all in addition to our traditional tools of, of audit products, um, criminal investigations and, and partnerships with other IG offices as we identify and address trends and cross-cutting issues. Uh, as you mentioned, my full statement is in the record. It describes many of the reports we issued last year. So I'll just close again by thanking all of you and asking for your continued support as we move through the process, the appropriation process for FY23. Um, the president's request, would provide 112 million for OIG in 23, which is an increase of about 5.7 million, which would allow us in, in, uh, in particular to provide more oversight of the infrastructure investments in NRCS, RUS and NIFA among other priorities. So with that, uh, we would be very happy to address any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, we will now proceed with questions. As I mentioned earlier, we will begin with the chair and ranking member, uh, then alternating majority and minority, with members present at the time the hearing starts in the order of seniority. After that, I will recognize members not present at the time the hearing is called to order in order of their arrival. Each member will have five minutes in each round, so please be mindful of your time. Ms. Fong, I have uh, two questions uh, for you uh, opening related to civil rights. Uh, first, you and I discussed at a re recent uh, Agriculture Authorizing Committee hearing, the $6 million increase for the Office of Civil Rights in the House FY22 bill. I'm extremely happy to report to you that we retain the full House level for OCR in conference and the conference report specifically says that the increase is for addressing program deficiencies identified by the Office of Inspector General. Now for my colleagues on this subcommittee, would you discuss what you see as the benefit of these funds? And second, at that same hearing with the Ag Committee, uh, you and Chairwoman Hayes discussed the impact of the 2018 reorganization of civil rights functions at USDA. Uh, you indicated that their strategic plan was no longer effective, as stated in a recent report on USDA's oversight and civil rights complaints process. I want to cut to the chase. Did the reorganization under the previous administration do more harm than good? If so, how can we fix it? Uh, 
Uh, thank you for your questions. And uh, I remember our dialogue at that hearing it was very productive. And uh, I appreciate knowing that the funds have been appropriated for uh, the Office of Civil Rights. That's, that's great information. Um, as, as members of this committee may know, we did an audit report last year that looked at the um, Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights' uh, um, Office's ability to handle program complaints of, of inequitable treatment. And we've, we had some very significant findings that the um, handling of complaints was much longer than set forth in all the timelines that would apply. And while we did our work, the staff of that office um, made it very clear to us that they felt they needed additional resources, both for staffing as well as for information technology systems to track their work and the progress and, and their outcomes. Um, and I think it's in relation to that um, that, that this committee was able and, and recognized the need to provide additional resources. Uh, my sense is that. Um, it will be very important to see how that office takes those funds, how they use it. Um, are they able to get the resources to where they need to get them so that they can make progress in terms of uh, addressing those delays and implementing an effective IT system? In terms of your question, Mr. Chairman, on whether the reorganization was uh, effective or not, um, I think our report indicates that uh, the approach to processing complaints, which had been to decentralize it and put more responsibility in the agencies with less oversight centrally, that that approach was not effective as borne out by our recommendations. And so we, uh, we will, watch with great interest to see how that office moves forward in the future. And at, at some future appropriate time, we will undoubtedly do additional work. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fong, uh, for that. Uh, I think I have about a minute left, so let me uh, go to another question. Uh, one of two questions related to animal fighting. Uh, your, your testimony discussed a recent dogfighting case in Michigan that OIG and other law enforcement agencies brought to a conclusion. Uh, do you wait for evidence that non-USDA related criminal activities involved before taking action on cases of dog or animal fighting? If you proceed alone, uh, how many cases have you pursued alone and how many with law enforcement? Second, uh, the FY21 bill included an increase of 500,000 earmarked for animal fighting and work and that funding is uh, in the base for FY22. How have you used those funds and are your resource, resources constrained in terms of your work for animal fighting? You got about 34 seconds for my time. <laughs> we'll be happy to provide additional detail in a QFR, uh, but very briefly, we get involved in these cases. We have about 67 open investigations currently. We definitely spent all of the 500,000 last year and more and we get involved in many different ways through hotline allegations, through referrals from the FBI, referrals from APHIS and the program officials, referrals from state and local law enforcement. Uh, any, any number of ways that you can think of, are, we, we do initiate cases based on that. And we work very closely with our state and local law enforcement partners on these cases. Thank you very much, Ms. Fong. My time has expired. And at this time, I'm happy to yield to uh, our acting ranking member, Dr. Andy Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris, you are recognized for five minutes. Hi, th thank you very much. Uh, let me first uh, just ask broadly, with the increase in funding uh, for COVID, and again, you know, just tens of billions of dollars of increase, uh, as well as the increase, the ongoing increase, I think, in the SNAP program through the, uh, you know, with the update of the Thrifty Food Plan. I mean, the, the enticement for fraud appears to be greater. So with regards to, uh, and, and you deal with the SNAP program in your testimony and, and with COVID funding uh, to some extent, but where do you think the largest fraud potentially could have occurred with the COVID funding to USDA? And what are you doing uh, to, to try to uh, search that out? With respect to the COVID response uh, funds, and, and thank you for your question on that. 
we have been looking at potential fraud in all the programs because we know that there is always a potential whenever there's a large amount of money. Uh, we also, as you know, have a hotline. And so we receive any number of allegations pertaining to all of USDA programs. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Farm Service Administration on the CFAP program in a proactive way to try and identify potential indicators of fraud. And we, we did that with FSA very early on. We issued a number of bulletins to their staff to say, take a look at this. If you've got situations coming up where you might see this indicator, please contact us. Um, because it's really important to get involved at the front end on these kinds of issues. We've also um, received allegations in the, in the food box program. Um, we've had a number of cases that have looked at those allegations. Um, and as well, you know, in, 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 the, in the SNAP program, um, the feeding programs, we receive allegations and run those down as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, okay. with regard to uh, the infrastructure oversight, and I know we, we I asked you about this uh, last year, uh, of grave concern to me is that, you know, we, we're, we're spending billions of dollars for broadband extension, for instance, but uh, is your office conducting uh, oversight into whether or not that those funds are used appropriately and grants given to providers who actually, to, uh, who actually can deliver on their promise? I mean, it's one thing to send the money to them, another one whether or not uh, they can actually deliver. And, and you don't mention that in your testimony. Yes, uh, we actually uh, have been following the broadband programs over a number of years. It's a matter that we re re regularly audit on a periodic basis. Um, we do have an ongoing audit right now of the ReConnect program, which looks precisely at the issues you're talking about, eligibility of recipients, making sure that recipients are appropriately selected. And through that audit, we hope to also uh, evaluate whether our US has addressed concerns that we've raised in prior audits over the years. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, under the Infrastructure Act, we do have oversight responsibility of those funds. Um, and we are at this time evaluating how best to move forward with that. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I have to tell you, one of the fascinating parts of this job is that I learn a lot of new things. And in reading your testimony, I came across the term data story. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar with what a data story is. So I did what everyone else would do and Google it. And uh, I, I'm curious uh, if what I understand is true is why would the OIG's office be doing data stories about programs? Why wouldn't, for instance, the Farm Service Agency do the data story about CFAP payments. I mean, why, why would it fall to the OIG's office? And that's a really interesting question. Uh, we view it as part of our role to bring transparency to government spending and how funds are being used. And we also view it as um, an opportunity for us when we do these data stories to uh, generate our own thinking about potential audit inspection and investigative work. So it's, we do it for those, you know, a range of reasons. In terms of explaining it, I'd be happy to ask Jenny Rohn to offer some comments if you would like more detail on that. We have maybe. a data story coming out soon, which I think is very exciting. Yeah, Ms. Fong, maybe just, just send me a copy of the data story. <laughs> thank you very much, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harris. At uh, this time, I'm uh, delighted to thank yield to the from Wisconsin, Mr. Pocane. Mr. McCain, you are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thanks for our guests being with us. Um, I'd like to try to get to two different areas, if possible, one being uh, animal welfare audits, the other being a meatpacking uh, plant. So on first on animal welfare, I just want to thank you for um, my honoring my request for uh, an audit around the enforcement of the animal Welfare Act with respect for dog breeders. I know it got abbreviated because of COVID, um, but I am looking forward to seeing it. And also the fact that you're going to continue that audit uh, in fiscal year 23. I was just curious if you could share a little more detailed timeline on what I can expect and what will be completed in the product. And that the second part of the animal welfare question is, as you know, the inadequate 
uh, Animal Welfare Act enforcement has been a longstanding issue uh, for APHIS. Your office found in a 2010 audit that the agency chose to take a little or no enforcement action against serious or repeat violators, which weakened the agency's ability to protect animals. Uh, a decade later, we're still seeing puppy mills with hundreds of violations of federal law, uh, and they, they get to keep their licenses while the animals in their cages uh, are the ones who are suffering. I appreciate that your office has conducted repeated audits of the agency and made many recommendations for how they can improve, but I'm disappointed that more progress hasn't been made. I'm worried that we're still gonna be asking the same question 10 years from now if something doesn't change. So what plans do you have to ensure that APHIS actually fulfills its statutory obligation to enforce the Animal Welfare Act going forward? Yes, and, and thank you for your interest in all of that work that we do and have done and will be doing. Um, I'm going to offer the mic to Gil Harden, who has probably more detail on the, uh, the audit that we're going to do in 23. Yes, thank you. And and the Congressman, we do plan to do that work in 23, as you know, and as, as Phyllis has said, we're starting our movement back into the offices and, and doing thinking about doing work on site. So that's why it was pushed to next year. But it will get into looking at more deeply the recommendations we made in the past in terms of enforcement. Which we need to do the work on the ground at the at the at the sites to know how well that's being enforced or overseen. Uh, we did continue to see you know problems with oversight and what we could look at uh, this time around, and so we will just continue that work in the future. And into the second part of the question about ensuring APHIS actually fulfills its statutory obligation in enforcing the Animal Welfare Act, Mr. Law. I, I think it, it, it will be as part of looking at how they dealt with those recommendations as, as to whether we can ask questions about how well or how they can better enforce the act. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the second area, uh, and I noticed uh, Madam Chairman has uh, joined us, and I know this is important to her too, is the COVID outbreaks at the meat packing plants. Uh, you know, last year we talked about your investigation into food safety and, and inspection services response to outbreaks of COVID at meat packing plants. I see that your fiscal year 2022 annual plan includes continuing to evaluate uh, this COVID response at meat slaughter processing establishments. I was wondering again, what the scope is on here and when we can expect to see that report, especially with concern on when your office's pulse survey found that 48% of frontline inspectors agreed that um, FSIS was uh, responsive to safety concerns um, during the pandemic. Yes, that audit is very close to completion. I think it's safe to say, Gil, you correct me if I'm wrong, that it should be out in the next few months. Yes. Um, and it does, the scope of it is, as you explained or um, discussed just now, it's what FSIS did with its COVID funds, how it ensured that inspections continued, um, the steps it took to ensure the safety of its inspectors and it's uh, whether it had sufficient resources for PPE and other kinds of equipment. So I, I think you will see that very shortly. Great. Also um, in poultry, I think uh, in your fiscal year 2022 annual plan, you're looking at an audit on the new poultry inspection system. Can you tell us a little bit about that timeline in that report? Gil, turn it to you. Yes, um, that is one it, it, we did include it in the plan that we published in October because of delays in terms of getting back in the office and actually doing work in the field. We have not started that work as of yet. Uh, we will be looking to see if we can start that later this fiscal year or early um, in 23. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've got 16 seconds, so I'll yield. Thank you very much, Mr. Pocane. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Newhouse, uh, who will be followed uh, by the chair of the full committee, uh, Ms. Lara, uh, who has joined us. And at that time, uh, she can uh, give uh, an opening statement and she can also ask her questions. But uh, I now recognize uh, Mr. Newhouse, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm gonna write this date down one of the few times that I get to go before her, Madam Chair. So um, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Dr. Harris as well. I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Fong and, and your team for being with us today. Thank you for all of the things that you do at, at USDA to ensure that the, um, you know, those 
precious federal taxpayer do dollars are being used, spent uh, uh, properly in everything that you do in support of the USDA mission. Uh, you know, combating waste and abuse is a, uh, is a huge job and something that we have to be ever vigilant on. I think in some of your, in, in some of the numbers in your statement, uh, I think bear repeating uh, fiscal year 2021, um, oversight work resulted in monetary results uh, uh, totaling over $686 million. I appreciate that. You led, that led to 228 convic convictions. Um, your investigative work is just a, a, a tremendous uh, record there and I appreciate your diligence in, in, in these results. Unfortunately, there's, you know, People are taking advantage of some of these things that are meant to assist American citizens. And that one example of a Georgia man who was sentenced to 30 months in prison, had to pay in restitution almost $250,000. These things happen um, and, and we need to have a strong oversight. So I appreciate the work that you and your, your team do. I, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I will submit questions for the record um, in anticipation uh, of attending the memorial service for the Dean of the House, Mr. Young. Um, uh, I'll be leaving shortly. And so I wanted to recognize that that's going on today, but I do, do fully appreciate the work that USDA uh, and the OIG office on behalf of the American taxpayer and appreciate you being with us this morning. Hey, thank you, uh, Mr. Newhouse. Uh, and at this time, uh, recognize uh, the chair of the full appropriations committee, uh, Representative DeLauro, the gentlelady from Connecticut. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be with you and thank you for recognizing me and thank you to uh, 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 Dr. Harris as well. Uh, it's great to see you again, Inspector Fong, uh, and welcome back to the appropriations committee. We're always so grateful for your testimony. I wanna ask about an issue that you and I have discussed before. Um, that's the hundreds of millions of dollars that have flowed to what I view as the corrupt Brazilian meat packer JBS with procurement contracts awarded by the department's agricultural marketing service. Uh, as I have said to you before, I'm concerned by that because as you know, the federal acquisition regulation and related USDA policies require that government contractors have quote, present responsibility. And accordingly, present responsibility can be impacted by fraud, bribery and other violations of federal laws. You also know that in recent years, I have repeatedly urged the department to open a suspension and department investigation into JBS to determine whether the company meets its legal requirement of, quote, present responsibility. They have refused. In the past, I've also urged you to conduct an investigation using your independent authority and responsibility under the Inspector General Act of 1978 to ensure that taxpayers' dollars do not continue to flow to a company engaged in criminal activity. At the time you suggested to me, and similarly your staff suggested to my staff, that you would not investigate because the Department of Justice had an ongoing investigation. Well, Inspector General, the DOJ has concluded their investigation. It ended with the Batista brothers pleading guilty, guilty, conspiring to violate the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit the guilty plea into the record. Stunning charges by the D DOJ, showing more than a decade of criminal activity, a massive bribery scheme by the Batista brothers to obtain illicit loans from Brazil's National Bank. These ill-begotten loans were then used by JBS to illegally enter and consolidated the meatpacking industry in the United States to the detriment to the detriment of America's farmers and ranchers, as well as consumers and their families. I could go on about JBS's illegal activity. They have a history of manipulating cattle markets, price fixing in beef and poultry. Recently, President Biden's National Economic Council released data showing that they are price gouging consumers at the grocery store. They have an abhorrent track record of exploiting their workers and failing to ensure a safe workplace. And since 2019, JBS, and this is in count of preceding years, J 
JBS has received $171.5 million and they are receiving subsidies today from the federal government. My question is simple. Now with the guilty plea, at, why have you not opened an investigation? Why is the federal government subsidizing what is likely the most corrupt corporation on the face of the earth? Ms. Wong. Yes, thank you very much for your concerns. We, I know we've had dialogue over the years on this issue. I, I appreciate the information you've provided for the record on the guilty plea. And I think you've raised an interesting question about whether or not uh, suspension and debarment is an appropriate remedy at this time, given that there has been a, a guilty plea and a conviction. Um, I think we would definitely, our staff will go back and see if there's anything additional that we can do now that the Justice Department is, is completed with its process. You can open up an investigation. Will you open up an investigation now that the guilty plea is there? That is the question. Now that we have a guilty plea, why is there not immediately an investigation into all of this? And at the, anyway, why can't we move that? What is the timing? Are you gonna to proceed to do that? And we are continuing to subsidize JBS. Today, we subsidize JBS and to the detriment of our farmers and ranchers in this country. I will, um say to you that we will go back and evaluate the situation to see if there is anything appropriate for us to investigate or whether there are other remedies uh, and we will we will get we will get back to you on that i i would hope you would if if, if, if they have been found guilty they have been found guilty we know what happens when someone is found guilty and that we cannot seem to have an investigation to deal with suspension and disbarment seems to be an abdication of responsibility and the abdication of the independent authority that you have to move forward on this. There would appear to be no going back and looking at what is there. you got a fait accompli. They are guilty of violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. There is so much documentation about their manipulating the markets, about price gouging, uh, about workplace where we had six people who died, who they didn't take care of their workers. And yet, we just seem to be, we cannot move. I need to know why, and I wanna know how soon we will have an investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. And uh, the documents uh, are submitted and received and made a part of the record of this hearing. Thank you, thank you very, very much. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, uh, Ms. Underwood. Uh, you have five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here and for the important work that you do. Cybersecurity needs to be front of mind for every industry in America right now, including agriculture. The cyber threats posed by Putin's unprovoked war in Ukraine and the SolarWinds hack last year underscore just how vulnerable our federal agencies and critical infrastructure can be. Weak cybersecurity at our federal agency expose, ex agencies exposes Americans to privacy and security threats while putting our national security at risk. And at USDA, attacks for disruptions to agency operations threatens our food supply, our economy, and our scientific achievements. So today I'd like to learn more about your assessment of the cybersecurity vulnerabilities at USDA and your plans in this space moving forward. Your office's fiscal year 2021 Information Security Modernization Act audit reported that USDA's IT security program for fiscal year 21 was, quote, not effective. This clearly is cause for some concern. Ms. Fong, without going into sensitive details on this public setting, um, can you tell us broadly what areas of USDA's IT security program warrant the greatest or most urgent attention for fiscal year 2022? I'll be happy to comment on that. And then Gil, I think you may have some additional detail to offer. Uh, the department's IT security posture has been a significant issue for any number of years. Um, we have not yet as a department made it to um, an adequate level of IT security. And that's something that just continually needs attention. Uh, what we see generally speaking is that at the department level, um, there are good 
policies that are put into place, but then each individual USDA agency has to implement that with regard to all of its IT systems. And that's where we see a number of challenges over the years. So uh, there, there needs to be concerted effort throughout the department to bring every agency into a secure environment. That being said, um, we do that FISMA review every year to provide an overall picture. We also have a number of ongoing and planned audits focused on specific aspects of cybersecurity that are especially vulnerable. Um, and I'll turn the mic over to Gil to offer some additional comments on that. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, with respect to some of the key areas um, for them to focus on this year in response to the FISMA review we did, they, they need to focus on areas of risk management, data protection and privacy, some security training and configuration man management type issues. Um, we also do looks just for, for awareness um, on IT security as part of our financial statement work. So it's covered in other areas annually as part of our, those reviews. Other work that we have ongoing, uh, two to highlight, one deals with some penetration testing that we're, that we're doing around security at this point in time. Another area is configuration of USDA's virtualization platforms. Um, we can be happy to schedule time with you and your staff to discuss some of that and maybe some more detail and so well as some other work that we're doing in the IT security arena, but it is one that we do have as a, as a matter of focus because of the sensitivities that you mentioned, as well as it being a longstanding security weakness for the department. Good. I'm looking forward to that conversation. The audit noted that USDA has at least 22 open recommendations for actions to improve IT security. Only four were completed last year, while 16 new ones were added. Can you tell us more about why it's important that the agency implement these recommendations in a timely manner? It, 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 implementing those in a timely manner will, will help put the policies in place so that they can be assessed, which is one of the areas that the department needs to to take the next steps to be at a, at a higher security posture. They do have policies and procedures in place that are consistently implemented. They need to implement some other ones, but they need to make, take the next step of assessing those, how well they were implemented and revising as appropriate. And only about a third of USDA systems were reviewed by your office in the fiscal 21 audit. What budget would your agency need to complete a full IT security review that included all systems each year? I would have to get back to you on that, but I, I would offer that we do a sampling of systems in, in any work, any IT work or any audit or inspection work that we do. So the systems that are sampled each year are different. Um, and so like three agencies in OCIO was part of the review last year. There will be different agencies and systems that are, that are part of the review this year. Uh, other, other systems are also covered in other reviews. Well, given the heightened threat environment, I think this is an area that we would like to continue to explore and work with you to ensure the protection, again, of not just the critical federal systems, but the data and information so that we can continue to have a robust and reliable food supply chain in this country. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Underwood. And at this time, I'm delighted to yield to the chair of the Military Construction Veterans Affairs uh, Subcommittee of the Full Appropriations Committee, uh, Ms. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the gentlelady from Florida. You are now recognized. Thank you so much, much Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with uh, the IG and her team. Um, I, I want to return to the issue of uh, animal fighting. I know a couple of members have asked about this and animal welfare in general, but the USDA does play a major role in animal welfare because you're in charge of enforcing the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and animal fighting is not only cruel and unethical, it can also spread disease. Um, and your role uh, is in particular critical to bringing to justice those that engage in this horrendous act. My, my question is of Mr. Tyrell. Um, Mr. Tyrell, uh, my uh, fellow animal lovers on this committee, as you can see, there are many, um, joined me in working hard to increase your budget so that you have the resources needed to successfully locate and identify perpetrators. Can you provide this committee with any details on what your office is doing with the increased funding Congress provided in recent fiscal years? And what are you doing to coordinate efforts with state and local officials to leverage those resources provided to combat animal fighting? Thank you, Congressman Schultz. 
Um, so we we work uh, very closely with our with both APHIS and our state, federal, state, and local counterparts in, in looking at the Animal Welfare Act and conducting these investigations. Uh, you know, every allegation we receive, we have to assess carefully to to look at the overall impact that each of these allegations may have on on, on a criminal investigation, on whether we should open a criminal investigation. Um, you know, these these are very complex investigations, obviously. And we consider a number of factors before we open them, but any allegations of health and safety uh, are really one of our highest priorities. Um, the monies that we received last year went a long way in helping us uh, tackle this problem and, and put more resources into it. So any additional resources will obviously help us uh, put more focus on this issue and, and try to um, you know, bring it under control as best we can. And coordinating with state and local officials so you can leverage those resources? We, we actively coordinate with state and local officials already. So, uh, you know, a lot of our, the allegations that we, that we get concern, concerning animal fighting actually come from our state and local counterparts. Um, and when they reach out to us, you know, we partner up with them and work very closely on trying to combat this problem. Have you been able to step up enforcement and increase investigations as a result of the funding? Do you have more reach specifically? We have. So last year, uh, as an example, you know, we nearly saw uh, uh, probably about a 50% increase in the number of investigations that we were able to conduct um, from the previous year. And, you know, a lot of that can be attributed to the additional funding that we received. Great. Um, I, I want to turn to issues surrounding Florida citrus. In, in 2018, Congress provided more than $2 billion for disaster assistance to help offset agricultural producers' losses related to hurricanes and wildfires. Within that funding, we allocated $340 million specifically for the Florida Citrus Block Grant Program, which is a joint venture between USDA and the Florida Department of Agriculture. These were funds that were a lifeline for many citrus producers in Florida that have been on the front lines of experiencing the damaging effects of climate change. Mr. Hardin, last June, your office finalized a report evaluating this program. Can you uh, provide us with a summary of your findings? Yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm problem with the microphone. Um, yes, we did take a look at that program. Um, and one of the key things that we found was that they that a significant number of the participants, 31 of the participants we looked at had not also applied for the wildland and hurricane indemnity program, which was a prerequisite for the, for the block grant. Um, we didn't make any additional um, recommendations regarding that matter in the report, just because we had mentioned, we had already made recommendations in another report related to the hurricane funding. Um, so I'm sorry, if they, if they made an, a mistake, does that mean that there needs to be more gu better guidance from the department so that they include enough information to be eligible to receive the assistance? Yes, I think that would be part of the answer. I mean, it was a, a, by the time. I'm not we were sure on, why you wouldn't have made any recommendations if that if, if that oh, was an issue. It, to to explain that a, a little clearer, I'm sorry. We had made recommendations to clarify that in another separate report, so we didn't need to make the recommendations again. Uh, okay, um, I, I'd like a little bit more information from you on this than my time is allowing. So okay. if so, if you could follow up with me, to. I would appreciate it. I'd have to follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Chair Wasserman Schultz. At this time, I'm delighted to yield to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Ming, for five minutes for your questions. Ms. Ming, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Inspector Fong and your team for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask about a report that your office had released last August regarding the SNAP online purchasing pilot. As you know, this 2014 initiative was dramatically expanded from five to 47 states, including Washington, D.C., last year due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I have strongly advocated for expanding this pilot, including working on a, in a letter with 94 New York elected officials from all levels of government to the previous administration. But as we uh, consider expanding, I want to make sure that this program is 
um, functioning with the utmost integrity to reach as many recipients as possible. And that integrity has to include protecting participants' uh, personal identifiable information. Uh, the report noted that FNS had not updated its risk assessment since 2014, and we know it's problematic because many people have to submit really sensitive information like a social security number or their date of birth. Um, the report also stated that FNS can do a better job of monitoring, evaluating, and documenting retailers' compliance with safeguarding this personal information of SNAP participants to which FNS agreed to. Um, wanted to ask how frequently should FNS be updating its risk assessment to protect uh, privacy and data? And also given that the total value of online SNAP purchase transactions increased from 18.9 million to more than 1.5 billion from March to December of 2020, are there any recommendations uh, for FNS to ensure the program's integrity? Um, I'll just offer a few comments and Gil may have more specifics. And thank you for raising that audit. I think um, it, it really highlighted the significant issues that you mentioned about protecting privacy information. That was really one of our significant findings there. Um, and the point that we were making on the risk assessment was that with the tremendous increase in the number of uh, states and, and the dollars, the volume, that it clearly called out for a new risk assessment because the risk had theoretically just been magnified. Um, I think in terms of moving forward, uh, we would recommend that FNS update risk assessments as appropriate when there's a change in the risk environment, if some other factor comes into being that would um, you know, militate towards updating the risk assessment, that would be the time to do it. Um, Gil, I'm gonna turn it to you for some comments. Um, yes, thanks Phyllis. And, and I would just echo kind of what you were saying in response to your question, Congresswoman, in terms of how often to update it, it's really driven by what's going on in the program and, and knowing what the changes are. Uh, clearly, with the, the increase in volume in the, in the program, they needed to update that risk assessment. Now that they know that there's the potential weakness with pr personal private personal information, they need to make sure that, that that risk is addressed as well. Most of all of the, the work that we've done at FNS with regard to COVID, as well as other agencies as well, has asked the question about risk. How have you, re how have you assessed that risk? what risk are you willing to accept and why are you willing to accept those? And if the ones that you're not willing to accept, what measures are you putting in place to address those risks? Um, so that's a very standard question that we're asking as part of that and most of the work. Thank you. And sorry, just to switch really quickly, I wanted to ask about another report that OIG had released about the Emergency Food Assistance Program, which was really helpful to us here in New York and around the country when our local pantries experienced a dramatic increase in requests for their services. But we know there are many challenges FNS faced in implementing TFAP during the pandemic, canceled food orders, inability to collect, conduct oversight of state agencies because of travel uh, restrictions. So from OIG's perspective, what lessons should FNS learn from the pandemic to ensure that they're better prepared to combat ongoing supply chain and food distribution issues? Um, in response to that, um, we're actually in the process of completing our work on TFAP. We've issued two interim reports. So there again, the one area that we saw that they needed to, to take better action on was looking at a risk assessment for TFAP and the changes that were happening traditionally versus um, going on with COVID. Um, but, but the team is also working on the final questions that we, we were looking at now and we may have some additional insights into your questions with that report that would be forthcoming. Great, would love to see that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Ming. Uh, at this time, I'm delighted to represent to recognize the gentleman from Texas, uh, Mr. Cuellar. You have five minutes and you are now recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and again, to the witnesses, thank you so much. Uh, the committee is a big supporter of the USDA's Reconnect program to help the rural and the underserved uh, communities uh, to make sure they can access the digital tools so they can improve their health 
educational economic uh, uh, outcomes. As you know, the uh, committee uh, added an additional $450 million, and I want to thank the chairman for his leadership on this Reconnect program in the FY22 appropriations. And that's on top of the $2 billion that got provided in the Infrastructure uh, Investment Jobs Act. Uh, my question, and I think we all got different communities that are uh, have high poverty along the U.S.-Mexico border. We have what we call the border co uh, colonias, um, basically no water, no sewage. And I think a lot of us members have similar type of uh, communities. Uh, my question is, do you all have any metrics or performance measures that have been established to ensure that the reconnect program is effectively serving those communities that are impacted by high and persistent poverty. Uh, it's a great program, but I, I, I just I keep hearing from constituents uh, in my area, and I don't know about other members, uh, about not having enough funding for this um, uh, uh, program so we can connect them. Appreciate any uh, any uh, uh, ideas on performance measures, or how you measure the impact of the Reconnect program. That's a really interesting question. Um, as you know, we've talked earlier in this hearing about the fact that we've got an ongoing audit or inspection of the Reconnect program focused on eligibility, which is, you know, an important question to ask. But your question goes even further, which is to um, to assess the impact of the of the program and are the funds getting to the communities that have a great need for them. And as I'm sitting here thinking about it, uh, we, the data story that we talked about earlier in the hearing, which is um, a product that we will be issuing shortly for the food box program, which takes data that shows where 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 the program monies went, who who um, touched it, who <clears throat> received the benefit of it, it could be that this would be an interesting project for us to think about from a data analysis standpoint to see is there data that shows, does, does RUS keep the data that shows the communities it's going to, what does that look like with an overlay of say census data um, and what can we learn from that? So I think that's a really interesting question and, and we will go back and give some thought to that. Jenny, um, I'll, I'll turn, Gil and Jenny might have comments as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to add from the rollout of the infrastructure money and, and starting to listen to how the department is dealing with all four some all four buckets of all four buckets of money. One of the things that they talk about is the equity action plans and and which is getting to those underserved or less served. And so we will be monitoring and following how they're going to measure that. And if they're not measuring that, asking questions as to as to how or why that's not being addressed. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, my time's up, but I, I appreciate it. Any work we can work, uh, the committee can work with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cuellar. Uh, I think we've completed the first round and we'll uh, move on to a second round. But during the second round, uh, given the fact that we've got some other activities, particularly the memorial for uh, Mr. Young, uh, we're going to reduce the time for the second round to two minutes. Uh, at this time, I yield to myself uh, uh, to uh, continue to question uh, Ms. Fong. Uh, the OIG's latest semi-annual report to Congress was issued in November of 21, and it shows significant decreases in the number of open audit recommendations, which are OIG recommendations of which agencies have not completed corrective actions. Uh, since OIG started reporting these open recommendations in 2014, the average number is about 420 at the end of a fiscal year. As of September 30th, 2021, the number of open recommendations uh, was down to 260. Uh, can you explain what that means? Is it because you're issuing few recommendations or the agency is putting more effort into implementing your recommendations or is it something else? Or is this cause for celebration? Thank you for the question. Uh, we issue recommendations where we think recommendations are warranted. So it's not that we're trying to issue fewer recommendations. I think uh, the 
the change that we're seeing comes from tone at the top at USDA, where the secretary has made it very clear to all of us that he wants to see these recommendations addressed where appropriate, um, take action. If circumstances have changed, uh, we get into dialogue with that. We have, our office has worked very closely in partnership with the Office of the Chief Financial Officer and the program agencies to really identify the issues that need to be addressed and, and to pursue them. And I think what we're seeing here is the result of that concerted effort on the part of the whole department to address these issues. Thank you, Ms. Fong. Um, Dr. Harris, you're recognized. Uh, thank you very much. And ju just a brief question. You know, I I've seen some memos from March 23rd from the, uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture instructing uh, the, uh, the WIC program, the SNA uh, SNAP program, and uh, the school lunch program uh, to conduct, to help conduct voter registration. And what's of concern to me in the memo is that, it, it, and I read it verbatim, it says, uh, the first memo says, the NVRA requires SNAP state agencies to offer voter registration opportunities to any person who applies or renews for an application. But it doesn't say that an instruction has to be provided as to whether or not someone is actually eligible to vote. So for instance, we know that under WIC and under uh, school lunch programs, people who are in the country illegally can get the programs, but obviously are not eligible to vote. They don't even have a, you know, they don't have a green card, much less eligible to vote with citizenship. Why is that instruction? I mean, wouldn't that be an important thing to emphasize that part of the education of the people who we are giving these voter registration forms should be uh, to, uh, to inform them of who actually can vote and, uh, and who can't? That's a very interesting issue. I personally am not aware and have not seen the memos. Um, I think I do understand your question and we'll have to go back, take a look at that and, and perhaps reach out to your staff, you and your staff to see if there's anything um, that's appropriate for us to do at this point. All right, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and if I can, Mr. Chairman, I'll be more than happy to enter the three memos into the record. Uh, and provide them uh, to the to the OIG. Uh, I just you know wonder whether this is the best yeah. use of. Yeah, I just wonder whether this is the best use of uh, nutrition program money, uh, because my understanding is administration money can be used to this. And if we're going to do it, uh, whether or not we should also be providing uh, clear guidance on who can and can't register to vote, or who can and or is not eligible to vote. Anyway, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harris. Uh, Ms. Underwood, you are now recognized. Thank you. Last year, constituents reached out to my office regarding a USDA licensed tiger exhibitor with a facility in my district. These constituents were horrified to find publicly available inspection reports from the Animal and Planet Health Inspection Service, APHIS, showing repeated violations of the Animal Welfare Act. Some of these violations affected the welfare of the animals, like a lack of veterinary care. Others endangered the community, like incidents insufficient fencing for tigers at another facility in Kansas. The idea of a local tiger king was scary enough, but APHIS's response added to our angst. We tried for months to get answers from the agency and we were eventually able to get a staff level briefing, but at that briefing, we were informed that the exhibitor's license had just been canceled. But then we learned last week that APHIS has reversed course and issued a new license to this repeat offender for a facility in Kansas. In a March 2021 report, your office assessed that, quote, APHIS cannot fully ensure the safety of the animals exhibited or the safety of the public who view those animals. In light of this disturbing example, I'm concerned that this is still the case. Ms. Fong, does your office plan to conduct any kind of follow-up to the March 2021 report to evaluate whether APHIS is now able to ensure the safety of animals and the public? Uh, just thank you for bringing that to our attention. I had not heard of that situation. Um, as you mentioned, we issued that report about a year ago. We don't normally do a follow-up audit a year later. We try to give the agency time to you know, address our recommendations. That being said, we can go back and take a look 
to see what the status of our recommendations are, where the agency is with it, and, and see if there's anything appropriate for us to do at this point. Yes, ma'am. I think that that would be an appropriate course of action. It's clear to me that APHIS has a lot of room for improvement and mm -hmm. OIG's review and recommendations are welcome. First step, that these wild animals and our community deserves better. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Underwood. Um, Ms. Fong, we talked about major management challenges last year and how some require persistent efforts year after year to even make progress. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about improper payments. It appears that USDA has not been compliant with various improper payments statutes uh, for each of the last 10 years. Uh, earlier this month, your office reported that the previous administration may have overpaid over $57 million to over 150,000 producers through the market facilitation program. Would you tell us what went wrong and what corrective actions have, has USDA taken and are they able or can they recoup the money? Thank you. Uh, you're referring to a report that we recently issued on the market facilitation program, uh, which was based on a statistical sample, a review of a, a number of producers and the payments that were made to them. And we, we found, you know, as you mentioned, that a number of payments were improperly made. The recommendations that we issued to the department were that FSA needs to strengthen its controls to make sure that they have the right documents to support the payments that they're making. And we also recommended that FSA go back uh, with respect to the 21 payments that we thought were not supported and, and talk to the producers and take any appropriate action to get repayment of the overpayment if appropriate. Um, so I think moving forward, you know, we've made those recommendations to improve the program and to try and recoup some of the funds. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harris. I have no other questions, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, I have uh, one other question. Uh, your annual plan for FY22 indicates that you expect to use about a third of your resources dedicated to the investigation side of OIG on the farm production and conservation programs. Uh, this is almost 50% higher than anticipated for last year. Can you tell us the reason you expect to need more investigative resources for the farm production and conservation programs this year? And are there trends of specific issues or concerns that you are expecting or that you are seeing? Thank you for that question. I think either Kevin or Ann would offer some thoughts on that one. Okay, um, just in terms of the program, each year we assess where we are in terms of what percentage of resources we use, and that's based on sort of what our current work is. So for FY21, we're looking at the number of cases we had with respect to the Farm Service Agency and the Conservation Services. And so from that perspective, that sort of serves as the basis for us to determine what our next year's work is going to do, especially in light of the fact that we have cases that go multiple years, right? We don't necessarily conclude a case in one year. And obviously with COVID, there have been a number of programs that are out there which are responsive um, and fall under the Farm Service Agency where we have seen an uptick in investigative work. And so that really is what accounts for the increase that we've seen um, or that we anticipate seeing for FY22. Thank you, Ms. Coffey. Uh, Ms. Fong, Ms. Coffey, Mr. Harden, Ms. Roan, and Mr. Terrell, thank you for your testimony and for spending time with us today. Along with what we've discussed, uh, we will also forward uh, additional questions for the record, and we appreciate your diligence in getting your responses to us in a timely manner. Now, Dr. Harris, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, I don't. I just want to thank the uh, Office of the Office of the Inspector General for the uh, you know the wonderful work that Inspector Generals do across the government agencies, and look forward uh, to working with you and working on uh, your budget requests. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Dr. Harris, uh, and all of the members uh, of the committee for attending. 
Uh, thank you also to our staff who put this hearing together. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank you, Ms. Fong and your uh, staff for your participation and for the excellent work that you do uh, year after year. Uh, with that, uh, I believe that this subcommittee has completed its work for the day and uh, the subcommittee is now adjourned.